When marveling upon Middle-earth's dwarven fortresses, elven palaces, and imposing cities of men, one can easily wonder how all these grand places and their material cultures come into being. Tolkien was a philologist, not an economist, but when reading between the pages of his works, a semblance of economic life is present in its various cultures. Indeed, Tolkien devoted a considerable amount of thought to the withertos and why fours of everyday life in his world, a phenomenon just waiting to be explored. Welcome to our new series on the economy and society of the cultures of Middle-earth. In this episode, we begin with the community of the smallest of peoples, the humble hobbit. If like Tolkien and his hobbits you enjoy a good book, there's a new documentary to check out from the sponsor of this video, Magellan TV. This documentary streaming service, founded by filmmakers, is being updated with new material all the time, and recently they released The Bookmakers. It's a broad look at the role and success of books in popular culture, focusing on what makes them special to their readers and on the artistry of their production, be it physical or digital. That's just a slice of the 15 or more hours of 4K high-definition content added every week for their subscribers at no extra cost covering loads of genres, science, true crime, travel, and especially history. They boast the richest and most varied history content available anywhere. Basically, you'll never run out of things to watch with Magellan TV. It's all viewable anytime, anywhere, on televisions, laptops, mobile devices, and more. Get access to 3,500 hours of ad-free documentaries for only $4.99 a month, and get a month for free by subscribing to Magellan TV via our link in the description. Hobbit society traces its origins, fittingly, back to the first year, according to the reckoning of Shirefolk, when the halfling brothers Marco and Cavallo obtained formal permission from the King of Arthurdain, Argalep II, to cross the Brown River Beranduin and settle in the lands beyond. For this, Argalep II demanded only that they keep the great bridges in repair keep the laws of Arthurdain and allow him to hunt thrice a year. The land into which they had come, though now long deserted, had been richly tilled in days of yore, and there the kings had once had many farms, cornlands, vineyards and woods. This land they called the Shire, which in their language meant an ordered district of government and business, the business of growing food and eating it and living in comparative peace and content. The Hobbit economy was mostly agricultural in nature. Life in the Shire during the Third Age, as Tolkien put it, had hardly any government. Families, for the most part, managed their own affairs. Growing food and eating it occupied most of their time. In other matters they were, as a rule, generous and not greedy, but contented and moderate, so that estates, farms, workshops and small trades tended to remain unchanged for generations. Whenever we think of the Shire, it almost always involves the subject of food. I hope there's something left for the latecomers to eat and drink. What's that? Tea? No thank you. A little red wine, I think. And for me, said Thorin. And raspberry jam and apple tart, said Beefer. And mince pies and cheese, said Bofer. And pork pie and salad, said Bomber. And more cakes and ale and coffee, if you don't mind, called the other dwarfs through the door. Put on a few eggs, there's a good fellow, Gandalf called after him, as the hobbit stumped off to the pantries. And just bring out the cold chicken and pickles. By the time he had got all the bottles and dishes and knives and forks and glasses and plates and spoons and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot and red in the face and annoyed. Such an impressive smorgasbord of gourmet dishes requires significant specialization of labor. Bilbo's wine, for example, likely came from vineyards such as the old Winyards of South Farthing, indicating the presence of cork makers and glass blowers. Meanwhile, his mince pies required pig farmers and bakers, while eggs would require chicken farms and so on. Moreover, the Baggins' plates and silverware would require some form of mining, pottery or perhaps trade. Another aspect of Shire society to consider is the daily lives of its denizens. Hobbits are an unobtrusive but very ancient people, more numerous formerly than they are today, for they love peace and quiet and good tilled earth, a well-ordered and well-farmed countryside was their favourite haunt. 
They do not and did not understand or like machines more complicated than a forge bellows, a water mill, or a hand loom, though they were skillful with tools. Hobbits chose to live a life unaided by hard industry or machinery, a sentiment inspired by Tolkien's childhood. From the age of four, Tolkien lived with his family in the village of Sahol, which, like the fictional Hobbiton, had a corn grinding mill by the water. The country in which I lived in childhood was being shabbily destroyed before I was ten, in days when motor cars were rare objects, I had never seen one, and men were still building suburban railways. Recently I saw in a paper a picture of the last decrepitude of the once thriving corn mill beside its pool that long ago seemed to me so important. Tolkien said that the Shire was inspired by a few cherished square miles of actual countryside at Sahol, and that Hobbiton was more or less a Warwickshire village of about the period of the Diamond Jubilee. Tolkien lamented how often the natural world and the simple life was bulldozed by the reckless march of industrial progress, a turmoil the author expressed in his description of the scouring of the Shire. Take Sandy Man's mill now. Pimple knocked it down almost as soon as he came to Bag End. Then he brought in a lot of dirty looking men to build a bigger one and fill it full of wheels and outlandish contraptions. They're always a hammering and a letting out smoke and a stench, and there isn't no peace even at night in Hobbiton. And they pour out filth for purpose. They fouled all the lower water and it's getting down into Brandywine. And if you want to make the Shire into a desert, they're going the right way about it. One needs only look at how Tolkien depicted the evil powers of Isengard and Mordor to understand his contempt for unchecked technology, as both these factions are industrialized and reliant on machinery with a disregard for the pollution they cause. Inversely, it is no secret that Tolkien loved nature and cherished the idealized English countryside, which we see represented in the Shire. Having now explored the economy and culture of the Shire, we will now move on to the most enigmatic pillar of its society, its government. As previously mentioned, the hobbits were originally subject to King Arthurdain, but when he fell to the forces of Angmar, the Shire was left without a ruler. In that war the North Kingdom ended, and then the hobbits took the land for their own, and they chose from their own chiefs a thane to hold the authority. The thane was the master of the Shire Moot, the captain of the Shire Muster, and the hobbitry in arms. But as muster and moot were only held in times of emergency, which no longer occurred, the thaneship had ceased to be more than a nominal dignity. The Took family was still, indeed, accorded a special respect, for it remained both numerous and exceedingly wealthy, and was liable to produce in every generation strong characters of peculiar habits and even adventurous temperament. Thus a basic hierarchy developed and continued to do so into the Third Age. The existence of an economic system begets the existence of a class system, and there does seem to be a subtle one at work within the Shire. No one had a more attentive audience than old Ham Gamgee, commonly known as the Gaffer. He held forth at the Ivy Bush, a small inn on the Bywater Road. He spoke with some authority, for he had tended the garden at Bag End for forty years, and had helped old Holman in the same job before that. Now that he was himself growing old and stiff in the joints, the job was mainly carried on by his youngest son, Sam Gamgee. Both father and son were on very friendly terms with Bilbo and Frodo. They lived on the hill itself, in number three Bagshot Row, just below Bag End. Sam, like his father before him, was a gardener, a working middle class and servant to Bilbo and Frodo. Apart from Sam, we also see the farmer-slash-working-class Cotton family who became instrumental during the scouring of the Shire. The fact that Sam married Rosie Cotton is evidence that class among hobbits was rigid and one did not often marry above or below their station. With that said, upwards mobility seems to have been possible as well, with Sam being elected mayor for seven consecutive terms in his later life. While the Gamgees were the salt of the earth, Bilbo and Frodo descend from rich aristocrat lineage. Being Bagginses made both Bilbo and Frodo upper class, and as far as we know, 
They both did not rely on any source of income, even before Bilbo received his treasure from the Smaug adventure. Another aristocratic halfling family were the Tooks. Peregrine Took I succeeded his father, Paladin II, and became the 32nd Thane of the Shire and Councillor of the North Kingdom. Consequently, both Meridoc and Peregrine came from aristocratic lines and were heirs to vast land within the Shire. Tolkien even plays around somewhat with the concept of Nouveau Riche. You see, your dad, Mr. Peregrine, he's never had no truck with this Lotho, not from the beginning. Said that if anyone was going to play the chief at this time of day, it would be the right Thane of the Shire and no upstart. Lotho Sackville Baggis contributed to the scouring of the Shire by selling pipeweed and buying up all the real estate within the Shire. He wanted to own everything himself and then order other folk about. It soon came out that he already did own a sight more than was good for him, and he was always grabbing more, though where he got the money was a mystery. Mills and malt houses and inns and farms and leaf plantations. He'd already bought Sandy Man's mill before he came to Bag End, seemingly. With all that said, the only government official in the Shire whose authority and jurisdiction we learn about in detail is the mayor of Mitchell Delving, who was elected every seven years at the Free Fair on the White Downs. The offices of Postmaster and First Sheriff were attached to his office. The Shire also had a police force, the Watch, presided over by 12 sheriffs, and a postal service, the Messenger Service. For these governmental services to exist, one would imagine some form of taxation existed, and to pay for this, perhaps pipeweed was essential. Speaking of pipeweed, the famous halfling leaf was first grown in the year 1050 by Tobias Hornblower in South Farthing. This luxury item exploded the economy of the Shire and spread as far as Gondor, where it was known as Hornpipe Twist, not Southern Star, and it is not said of Sweet Galenus that the men of Gondor esteem it only for the fragrance of its flowers. It was also in Bree, where pipeweed spread from the Bree hobbits to the other races. Bree was an important trading outpost, sat on the intersection of the Great East-West Road and the Great North-South Road, a place where men and hobbits dwelt together, and a perfect location for commerce. Unfortunately, Bree's pipeweed trade would be abused by Lotho and Saruman during the scouring of the Shire, which greatly disturbed real estate throughout the halfling realm. He liked to extend his power, especially into Gandalf's province, and he found that the money he could provide for the purchase of Leaf was giving him power, and was corrupting some of the hobbits, especially the Brace Girdles, who owned many plantations, and so also the Sackville Bagginses. Overall, from everything we have analyzed, we can conclude that during the Third Age, the Shire was a non-industrialized agrarian society with a small government and a small internal economy with limited external trade. They were focused primarily with food production and had a loose and subtle class system with very little administration. In summary, the Shire represented an idealistic world where the best things in life are truly the little things. Our series on the cultures and societies of Middle-earth will continue, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.